So you had this idea, and now this idea has you. It needs to be fed, burped, changed, built, tested, and sold. Which means you need staff and infrastructure, and all of that costs money. How are baby fintechs supported? How do you even find people with the resources and inclination to fund ideas that are not proven? How does one conjure an angel investor, and where exactly are incubators found? To be honest, this part is kind of complicated, but we know just the guy to help us out. Oh, we couldn't get him. Oh. Eric, take it away. Hi, I'm Eric Hazard. You may know me from such video series as Focus on FinTech. You know the one you're watching right now. If you're here for the makeup tutorial, this is not it. Let's take a quick look at investing and just how Sally and Stevie's startup would typically go from the idea of the lemonade stand to the next lemonade craze. That's a profitable global phenomenon. First, they'll have to break their piggy bank, like our experts. I decided to sell my house to start this business. We all put the, the, the business on our credit cards. I actually left a great job at Google that I've been doing for about 10 years. I bootstrapped the company, so you know, paying for, paying for it out of my, my own pocket. The next step is mom and dad, and Uncle Pete, and Grandpa. Basically, friends and family and anyone else who will give them some cash. At this point, Sally and Stevie can set up an LLC and hire lawyers to draw up contracts, giving each investor a piece of their company. There can be a lot of misconceptions about how fundraising works, and I, I think there's no one path or journey. For us, starting when we when I started going to friends and family, it was quite simple. They really believed in what I believed in me and and knew my work ethic. And so, um, asking for money was the hard part for me to do, but actually receiving the money was was quite easy. Now, that's not always the case for everybody. I was really fortunate in in that situation to have that. Next, Sally and Stevie will need to pray really really hard for an angel because at this point they have no go-to-market plan and no revenue plan they don't even have their customers identified and it's going to take a miracle angel investors could be a private individual a hedge fund or a venture capital firm anyone really they are the first round of professional investors looking to put a relatively small amount of money down in hopes of a 100-fold return meeting them and finding the right match is not a simple task it all really started with, with one introduction. Somebody that I had met who had provided some mentoring said, you know, um, in the healthcare space said, you know what, this is so interesting, but I don't understand the, the fi I don't understand financial services, but I know the guy who does. So he loves the healthcare world, he comes from the financial world, he's gonna, he's gonna get this. And it was that one introduction that really changed everything. And he introduced me to other angels who then also got passionate and involved. And then through that, through the network, was where we, where we met through extensions of people who knew him, some of the other venture capitalists who came into the rounds. We raised our original uh, angel round in, at, toward the end of uh, 2013, early 2014. Um, brought in people like Michael Burry into that uh, round, and then since then we've brought on um, numerous investors, including Andreessen Horowitz, who is our single largest investor still. Tell me a little bit more about meeting with Michael Burry. Michael Burry uh, is best known for being the guy in the big short, being played by Christian Bale. So the guy that saw the real estate market crash coming, the guy that realized you could use a credit sure, default yeah. swap to bet against the housing markets, he saw the potential in Pierce Street, and he made an investment early on. Yeah, the, me the meeting was about, it was supposed to be a half an hour. People said, you're going to get 20 minutes, it's going to be in and out, don't be offended if it's very short and whatever. An hour and a half later, we're in that meeting, and he really likes the idea, and we, we really hit it off. At the end of it all, we said, hey, would you like to be an advisor, because you seem to really appreciate what we're doing. And he said, no, I don't want to advise this business, I want to invest in this business. And that, at that point, not only were we glad to have him on board, but then that gave me a lot of comfort in leaving this very comfortable job that I'd built at Google uh, to go uh, start that whole entrepreneurial all over at the bottom of the uh, journey, all over at the bottom of the totem pole. Interestingly, my first company that I started uh, back in the, the mid late '90s. We raised uh, much of our money initially from angels, and we had about 50 different angel investors that invested with us. And we had one angel investor, his name was Phil Buchanan. And we met with Phil, and I was in my 20s, and he said, 
hey, we're going to invest in you. And they were gonna put in, their angel group was gonna put in two or $300,000. And then we said, Phil, is there any way we could have an advance right now? And he said, well, yeah, when you say right now, when do you need it? And we said, right now, today. <laughs> like today. Do you, do you have a checkbook on you? And he said, well, how much do you need? And we kind of looked at each other, we're like $2,500. <laughs> So he wrote us a check on the spot for $2,500 so we can pay our rent. With this funding, Sally and Stevie can quit school, stop doing chores, hire some other coders for the website, and develop the VR app. Then it's on to the incubator. At this stage, they'll get the revenue plan ironed out, identify customers, and get ready to go to market. Here's where the seeds come in. VC firms invest in companies like the Lemonade Stand, they think the fundamentals are solid and this could actually work. They invest a couple hundred thousand dollars to hire a sales team and move out of the incubator into a decent office. We see so many young companies come and, and talk to us and you see, you feel that they're walking in with their beautiful shiny platforms. They're all excited. They tell us their story. And very often we'll say, hey, this is very nice, but you know what? You're solving last year's problem. It's extremely important you understand where you fall in the stack of offerings that a, either a company or a consumer will be, um, will be using. And if you don't understand that from the get-go, uh, and you don't understand that those values and those opportunities are shifting as you talk, you might end up with a beautiful technology that you can put on a shelf because your window of opportunity is getting us uh, uh, shorter and shorter as we move along. That reminds me of a saying that I've heard in the fintech community. Artificial intelligence is what you tell the investors. Machine learning is what you tell the developers. Even as an investor, I want to know that technology is creating some defensibility. And so, and entrepreneurs know that. It's about the emotional intelligence and the diversity of the team that's going to lead to success. We don't expect them to have their story. That's why they come to the Barclays Accelerator Powered by Techstars, is to hone that message, get their customer discovery done, and then hit the gas. Companies are looking for business development and, and fundraising opportunities. So it's about putting decision makers in a room to forge those relationships. Now, if I'm doing my job right, the companies have actually already been exposed to the venture community, and the venture community is also tying those dots together. And when they see it culminating on stage, the progress they've made, the traction, and probably most importantly, how they're able to articulate their vision, that's really the culmination. And that's really what's going to lead to the conviction it takes to write a check. You're telling the story of uh, who you are, why it's credible, of what you're, going to, you know, what you're going to be doing is credible and they should believe you. What you're building today and where you are in that process, but also you need to let them see the kind of your business along a trajectory and not, not just where it is at any given point in time, but that here was the original idea, here's how far you, what kind of progress you've made in building toward that idea. And then what is the big picture opportunity that you can really do with this, with the business? And then how does that impact other people's lives and why is that actually important, something they should get behind? Each VC is very unique and different. And so really trying to understand what is their thesis and that's probably where you're going to spend time on. So I had some that were very focused on the technology and um, one that was in particular only interested in investing in AI driven technologies. Others are more focused about what is like you know what part of the business and financial services are we going after and how are we going to how are we going to scale that out. So it's really trying to understand quickly what is important to them and then customizing everything you're doing and focusing focusing around that. I have now two companies that I raised venture capital money for and the first time I did it I didn't think there was any difference between VCs. It was like if somebody's going to give me money, I'll take that money, whatever it takes. Because you just got to, you know, you got to move on, you got to get the money and grow. Then the second company I brought in Sequoia Capital and Technology Crossovers big name VCs and I recognize there is a difference. And so I, I think the important thing is if you're going to raise outside equities, make sure you've got uh, the same goals with the VC providers. Not all of them. A lot of them are just looking for a fast uh, turnaround and a fast exit. That may be okay, may not be. Now let's talk about the funding alphabet. It starts with Series A, Series B, and Series C. And it's easy as one, two, three. In Series A, the goal is optimizing the company, 
Sally and Steve will get about a million dollars from VCs and other investors for more hiring and to purchase the lemons by the truckload. At this point, we're starting to see revenues. Series B is for building. Look at 10 to $50 million for hiring a marketing team, extending the tech team, warehouses for storage, and stands on every corner. Lemonade as a service. This is where the real revenue starts to be generated. The 50 to $100 million they'll get in Series C will make the Lemonade stand a national name. And if all goes well, the rest of the investment alphabet, Series D, E, F, and so on, will take them global and make them public. To Lemonade will be a new verb, and all the investors along the way will have made their profits. Last year, we raised our seed round, which was, which was oversubscribed with a mix of high net worth angels as well as venture capitalists. So as you think about the next steps, are you going to be looking at raising another venture capital round, or are you going to be taking revenues from your clients and applying that back into the business? So we deployed the capital directly into the product, into expanding the team. We had been a very lean team up until late last year, and then this, the capital allowed us to start bringing on some more people so that we um, were able to, to really kind of scale what we're doing. When you're a private company and you're VC backed, you're serving professional private investors. And when you're a public company, you're serving the public markets. Uh, how is it different being a publicly traded company? Well, it's a private company because you build up a very close rapport with your board. The board understands what's going on month to month. They understand the challenges, the opportunities. They're fully bought in. So they're very supportive of what you do. When you become a public company, it's the ultimate no excuse environment. It's what have you done for us lately, quarter by quarter. And um, I think the challenge for, for me or for any other entrepreneur is how do you keep the balance between kind of focusing on the numbers and delivering what the analysts want while continuing to innovate for the future. Someone once told me before they raise money, they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. After they raise money, running around like a chicken with their head cut off, but they had somebody chasing them. And so begins your business journey, finally graduating with honors and maybe a loan or two. What does it take to continue this success, evolving and adapting to new environments? How do you continue to thrive? And what happens if you fail? Next time on Focus on Fintech. Oh, you're still here? Go home. It's over. Goodbye.